turn to it. It's uh, the shortest uh, chapter in the book of Galatians, but it is, uh, I think it's one that has one of the most profound messages about one of the freedoms that we have been given through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it one, it's one that really has a lot to say to us as a congregation and as a body of Christ this morning. So as we begin, let me ask you a couple of questions about your week this week. Who decided what you did with your time last week? Who decided where you went last week? Who decided what you did? Last week, did you have the opportunity to minister to somebody in such a way that is going to impact them for eternity? Either their eternity or your eternity or both? Did someone hurt you last week? And you had a choice to either forgive or to get even. And which did you decide or did you give them the gift of forgiveness? Did you have a chance to serve somebody else in a way last week that they saw not you but the presence of the Holy Spirit at work inside of you? Basically what I'm asking you is were you living the life of Jesus in front of people last week or were you calling the shots? Chapter 6 of Galatians is, is summed up in the idea that the, one of the freedoms that Christ gives us, because it is for freedom that he sets us free, is that we are freed in Christ from self-service to one anothering. Those that have been here for a while know that that's one of my favorite Bible words, one anothering. One anothering is where we take care of one another and we serve one another. This is a concept that is found throughout the New Testament. Um, one of the things that distinguishes the believer from the unbeliever is that the believer, for the most part, is um, serving self. The Christian is serving others. We need to remember here, when we talk about the freedom that we have in Christ, that freedom is not doing whatever you want. True biblical freedom is a deep commitment to serving God and loving others. That's what freedom looks like. It's freedom to serve God. We're freed from our bondage to sin, to the power of sin, so that we can serve God from a pure heart and mind, that our good works are not tainted by sin, but because they're empowered by the Holy Spirit, they truly are good works that glorify God and have an impact for eternity. And that also frees us to love others or, or to one another. What we're going to see in, in Galatians chapter 6 this week are, are these encouragements, that we're going to be encouraged to bear and to share the burdens of others within the family of God. One of the things that God frees us up for is from being so wrapped up in ourselves that we can go to those who are hurting, who are burdened, who are caught in a sin, and that we can come to them lovingly and encourage them to get back on the right path. One of the things that chapter 6 reminds us is that uh, we have been freed in Christ to love and serve others the way God intended for you to do. As I mentioned, we need to realize that the freedom that we have through the gift of Jesus Christ is not an independence or the absence of constraint. The Bible actually calls it license or licentiousness. Licentiousness means you do whatever pleases your sinful desires. That's not what freedom is, but biblical freedom is a deep and abiding commitment to love God, to serve God, and to love others. So Galatians chapter 6, as I said, is a powerful chapter, one I really like because it confronts one of the biggest problems that exists in congregations today. Um, and that problem is what we call the comparison mentality. What, what tends to happen amongst Christians and in congregations is that we kind of like to look around and compare our situations to others' situations. We'll compare our prosperity. Well, why, why, why do they have more money than I have? Does God love them more than he loves me? Why do they have a nicer house? Why, why do they have this? 
Ooh, they're not doing so well. Why, why do they have this illness? Why are they struggling with this? Maybe God is judging them. Maybe God is more pleased with me because my health is good and they're struggling. Or, or why, why do they think that that's okay? We'll, we'll compare our ethical standards or we'll compare our convictions and we'll say, I can't believe they think that this activity is okay, that they're not convicted about this. What Galatians chapter 6 confronts is when, when your view is this way, you are being led by your sinful nature. The comparisons that we should make and the only comparisons that we should make in the body of Christ is this way. How does my life, how does my mindset, how does my heart compare to God's heart and God's life? The Apostle Paul who wrote this letter is a great example of this. You've heard me mention this before. The, the Apostle Paul, if, if you look at his letters kind of chronologically, Paul starts out as a young Christian and Paul goes, I'm a sinner, you know. And then later on, more towards the end of his life, Paul goes, uh, I'm the chief of sinners. He goes, you want to see the best person at sinning? That's me. I'm the head guy. I'm the quarterback. I got sinning down perfectly, Right. At the end of his life, Paul says this, I am the worst sinner who ever lived. Now, what was Paul doing? He wasn't comparing himself to you. We would look at it, right? I remember as a young Christian, I looked at what Paul said, and I went, Paul, you're just wrong. You're crazy. God used you, Paul, to write most of the New Testament. If 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 you, give, if you believe that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, which I believe, that means that God used Paul to write 14 of the 27 books in the New Testament. More than half, that's, I'm not good at math, but that's more than 50%. 50% of our New Testament was written by one man, the Apostle Paul, who says, I'm the worst sinner who ever lived. That guy wasn't comparing himself to us. And we shouldn't. Do you understand the mistake I was making as a young Christian? I was comparing myself to Paul and going, Paul, you're crazy. You're, you're much better. But what Paul was saying was this. The longer I walk with the Lord, the closer I become to him, the more I understand his heart and his character and his nature, the further I realize I am actually apart from him. When we're a young Christian, when we're a new Christian, we think, you know what, I got about three bad things, I got three big sins, you know, I clear those up and I'm pretty good. And then we begin to see the heart of God and the nature of God and what He is truly like, and then we start to go, oh man, I, I'm sinning in my thoughts, I'm sinning in my words, I'm not just sinning in what I do, I'm sinning in what I don't do that God has called me to do. And that's actually a very healthy thing. And when we see that, when we compare ourselves to God's standard of perfection of who he is, we marvel all the more. That's when we can say, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Because the more we recognize how sinful we are apart from the freedom that Christ gets us, the more we realize how amazing God's grace is that through the blood of Jesus Christ, he looks at us and says, you are perfect. You see, when God looks at you in Jesus Christ, he sees you as his pure, perfect, spotless bride because of the finished work of Christ that has been applied to your life. And that is how we need to see each other. When we do look at each other, we need to look at each other through that lens of God, through that eyes of God, and stop this uh, comparison mentality, whether it's blessing or, or struggles. One of the freedoms that Christ gives us is this freedom from, from this culture to measure our worth or to measure our value against each other. Galatians chapter 6 confronts our drive to compare ourselves to one another. You see why it's important? <laughs> you see why it's important? So, what are we going to see in Galatians chapter 6? We are going to see that selfishness 
is a sign that sin is leading your life. That your old nature or that you're operating in your own strength and your own power. What I was asking you, th those questions at the beginning, was kind of just a question of saying, who was leading you this week? Were you making the decisions? Were you making the desires? That's one possibility. Or the other possibility is that selflessness is a sign of the Holy Spirit's leading. When we're focused on others, when we are looking to serve God by serving others and loving others, that's a good sign. The Bible says that we are walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's an interesting challenge for you in that. A, a real sign of Christian maturity or a real sign of the Holy Spirit leading you is that when you get up on Sunday mornings to come to church as you're getting ready, you should be thinking and your prayer should be, who can I bless today? Who's going to be there that I can encourage, that I can bless? Don't raise your hand, but how often do we actually do that? More often, right? What are we thinking on Sunday mornings? I hope it's songs that I like today. Yeah, I really hope it's this one. I love that song. I hope the pastor's interesting today. I hope he has one of those good illustrations or good stories. I hope there's something that I can learn today. I hope there's something that will encourage me that I, 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 right? Is that bad? Are any of those things bad? They're not bad. Those are all good desires, right? But they're not the best desires. They're not the best desires, and they're not the heart of God. Selflessness is a sign of the Holy Spirit's leading. Our sinful nature is a selfish nature. What is in it for me? The new nature, which is Christ living in us, or the Holy Spirit living within us, is a loving others nature that says, how can I show, how can I spread the love of Christ today? Why is that true? Because what God or what Christ is trying to do in us as his children, as a believer, is to replicate his nature or his character within us. And what is the nature of God? The nature of God is a selfless nature that is concerned for what is best for us. We, I just gave you two examples here, right? It's all out in Scripture. For God so loved the world, finish it out for me, for God so loved the world that he, that whosoever, how much did God love the world? How much? It's saying to what degree did God think about us and our needs? He thought about it so much that in eternity, Remember, in eternity, before Adam and Eve ever sinned, before they were created, God knew exactly what they were going to do, how they were going to respond to that freedom. They were not going to value the freedom they had in Christ. They were going to throw it away for bondage to sin out of pride, out of the belief that they knew better than God. They allowed Satan to convince them that God was holding out on them, that they didn't enjoy everything they should have. So in eternity, before that ever happened, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit said, you know what? Once they blow it, they can't save themselves. So Jesus, you're going to go. You're going to die. You're going to do this. When did they decide this? What Romans 5, 8 says this, but God shows his love for us in that we were still sinners. Can you finish this one out? But God shows his love for us and that in that while we were still sinners. Anybody know? Christ died for us. Do you see the others part of it here? Jesus did not come to this earth for himself. There was no benefit in Jesus coming to this earth, living a perfect life, dying on a cross. It didn't benefit him. It didn't bless him in any way. He did it because we needed it, and it was the only chance he had. You can say that, yes, it glorified him. It revealed who he truly was, a God who loved the world this much. Do you understand? While we were still enemies, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the message of, of Galatians chapter 6, that if you are going to be led by the Spirit, you are going to look like 
Jesus. He uses a farming illustration here, which Paul says, you are going to harvest what you plant. Now, I'm not a farmer, but I am a gardener. And one of the things I can tell you is I have never planted any seed in my garden and wondered what kind of plant was going to come up. I've never planted a sunflower seed and thought, I sure hope this turns into a sunflower plant. Ah, if it's a tomato, I guess that's okay, but I'm really hoping for sunflowers. I've never planted a potato and thought, I hope this isn't cucumbers. I'm not being silly, but sometimes we are silly in our spiritual lives. We plant the deeds of selfishness. We plant the deeds of our old nature that we're focused on ourselves rather than serving God and loving others. And then we're like, why am I not being blessed? Why am I not growing in the Lord in maturity? I don't understand that. And God looks at you and goes, what did you plant? So selfishness equals spiritual death. What is spiritual death? It's separation or a lack of fellowship with God and others. If you are I, me, my, don't be shocked that you don't have good fellowship and harmony with others. Some of you have been here long enough to know I may sound like beating a dead horse or it may sound like I'm beating the drum over and over again, but you know what I'm about to say, right? Because we miss this so many times. The Christian life is what? It's not about you. It's not about you. It is about serving God, and he says, the way you serve me is to love others and serve them. So if you plant love, if you plant love and service to others, do you know what gets returned into your life? Love. You see, our, our, our sinful nature says, boy, but if I'm selfless, if I serve others and put them first, am I going to get any blessings? Am I going to get anything in my life, right? We're like afraid, like if, if we're selfless, God's not going to bless us or take care of us. And God's like, are you crazy? He goes, if you plant love, what is going to be returned to you? Love. Because you're growing love within the body. If you plant love, and, and notice in Galatians 6.10, it says what? Do good to others, especially those who are of the body. In other words, especially in the church, especially in the congregation. But notice, where else are we supposed to plant love? To a lost and dying world. When they experience the true love of Jesus Christ, that is what draws them to Christ, not to you. Some of you remember way back in the day, I, I challenged you and said, if you don't have non-Christian friends, you're not doing it right. You see, the truth is that far too many Christians have non-Christian projects. And what I mean by that is you have some non-Christians in your life that your desire is to see them come to Christ. Is that a good thing? That's a great thing. That's the best thing. Is there anything wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. But if the only reason you are involved in their lives is so that they might become a Christian, they're not truly your friends. And they will discern that pretty quickly. And they will say, oh, this person doesn't really love me. They don't really care about me. I'm just a project to them. When I keep saying I'm not going to go to church, eventually they give up on me. When I'm not engaging with what they're doing, they, they disengage with me. Do you understand? Jeremiah, the prophet, was given a ministry where God says, I want you to go and preach to the people. And he said, FYI, as you begin, I want you to know, nobody's ever going to listen to you. You're going to have zero converts. All right, go preach, go get them. That's an incredible ministry that Jeremiah carried out very faithfully, right? Because he was serving God and loving others, even though God told him from the beginning, in an, you, you are doing eternal work. You're not going to see the results here, but you're doing eternal work. Will you love someone who's a non-believer if even in your lifetime, through all your love, they don't come to Christ? That's the nature of God. While we were enemies, while we were still sinners, He loved us 
and Christ died for us. This is Romans chapter 6. Oops, okay. Let me go back one. So, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 6. Sorry, Galatians chapter 6. Okay, so, got it? Do we understand Galatians chapter 6? Okay, let's hear from the Apostle Paul. Galatians chapter 6. My dear Christian brothers and sisters, now someone may be caught in a sin. A sin may overcome someone. But those of you who are being led by the Holy Spirit, you should show that person in gentleness and love the way back to the right path. But you must be gentle and you must be kind with him or her. And you must be careful that the sin does not tempt you and you become entangled in it also. Help each other when you have troubles. Then you will obey the law that Christ gave. Now someone may not be important, but they may think that they are. That person is lying to himself. Each person should examine their own behavior, not the behavior of others, but their own behavior. And if it's good, if it's pleasing to God, if it's in accordance with His Word, then they can be pleased with what they are doing. But you should not compare yourself with anybody else in the congregation. Everyone is responsible for his or her own life. You're not anyone else's Holy Spirit. He'll do that job. Now, if someone is teaching you about the Word of God, then you should share all good things with that teacher. Now, understand this clearly. You cannot cheat God. You cannot rob God. A farmer harvests the same exact plants, a farmer harvests the same exact crops that he plants. You cannot harvest something that you first don't plant. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is a spiritual truth. A man who lives by his own desires is going to reap spiritual death because of those sinful desires. But a man who walks in the power of the Spirit will always experience spiritual life because of the life of the Spirit. So then, don't become tired as you do good things for everyone, but especially good things for those who are in the congregation, those who are already part of the body of Christ. You should love them and serve them as you love and serve your heavenly Father. Now, I want you to know that I am writing this part of the letter on my own. Do you see how big of letters I have written? Pause for a second. We we believe that the, the physical struggle that Paul had was something to do with his eyesight, that it was something very bad. Paul writes about eyes a lot. He writes about, you remember earlier in Galatians, he said, when I came to you, I was very sick, and if you could have plucked out your eyes, you would have given them to me. Um, so we believe here what Paul is saying is he had to write really large in the letter so that he could see it himself. And so Paul's letters were dictated, of course, to a secretary, but often at the end of his letters, he would sign a little greeting to just say, I want you to know it's from me, you know, okay? Unpause. I am writing this to you myself. You can see the big letters that I am writing to you here. Now, some people want to insist that that someone must circumcise you. They're doing this because they want to make a good impression on other people. They're comparing themselves to other people, and they want people who they think are important to think that they are important. And they do this so that they won't suffer and no one will give them a hard time. But the truth is they would suffer if they preached the truth of the cross of Jesus Christ. Someone circumcised them, but they no longer obey the Jewish laws. Now they want to circumcise you and make you obey the laws that they are no longer obeying because they want to make a good impression on people who don't matter. As for me, I am completely at peace and completely confident that I am doing and preaching what the Lord Jesus Christ 
has asked me to do and preach, and I'm telling you all that he has done for me. The only pride I feel is in the message of the cross of Jesus Christ and how he loved us. What the affairs of this world have the same impact on me as they have on someone who is dead. In other words, none. What really matters to me, what's impacting me, is that God is making you into a new person. One man will have allowed someone to circumcise him, and another man may not have allowed someone to circumcise him, but neither one is important. What is important is that God is making you into a new person. I pray for all of you to live in this way. I pray that God will make you peaceful, and I pray that God will be kind to you, and I pray this for all of true Israel, which is the family of God. Finally, nobody should give me any more grief or cause me any more trouble. The physical scars that I have in my body show that I belong and that I have suffered for Christ. My dear Christian brothers and sisters, I pray that our Lord Jesus Christ will show his grace, his kindness to you all. Amen. Let it be so. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this word today. I believe it's a much needed word in the church. I, I see it in my own life, as I'm sure others see it in theirs, this in, in incessant insistent desire of our old nature to want to compare ourselves to others, whether it's blessings or troubles or maturity or whatever. Father, as, as, you, as we sing in the great hymn, let us turn our eyes upon Jesus and look full in your wonderful face so that the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and grace. May we compare ourselves only to you. That's our standard. That's our example. That's our model. And when we do that, when we are led by your Spirit, we'll, we'll, we'll love you with a whole heart, mind, and strength, and we'll serve others wholeheartedly, unselfishly, as if we are serving you. And that will not only transform the congregation, but it will make a dramatic impact in a lost and dying world when they see the love of Christ manifested in our lives and in our hearts and in our minds. Father, for this we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.